Are we ready? Okay. Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Felix Leder and I will talk about attacking through the software supply chain, trying to give you an overview about kinds of attacks that we are seeing and also what you can do about it. Um, I'm coming from a company you've probably never heard before. It's called Crosspoint Labs. Uh, we are investment companies. We invest in cybersecurity companies. And uh, the specialty of the labs team is that we basically bring in technical expertise in order to grow great companies to even better. Uh, for example, when there's an opportunity to, to grow with AI or machine learning, we bring in experts and bring that skill into uh, the companies. If they want to move stuff to the cloud from on-prem or the other way around, we basically have people that have done this a couple of times and can help with that. Um, so even if you haven't heard about Crosspoint or Crosspoint Capital before, maybe you've heard about some of the companies that we own. And uh, today's presentation is also a collaboration um, with some of these companies who have provided input. So we hope to make this a little bit interactive and uh, fun. So the whole beginning will be basically consisting of war stories. Cases that you have probably heard about, maybe not heard about, but trying to portray the whole picture, a 360 degree view of what a supply chain attack through software is and how it can happen. I hope that you from that get an idea about the complexity of the problem. And then we also want to talk about solutions, how to depend. And uh, no matter if you're hands-on developer or security person or more like compliance driven, I have something for you later on. So special thanks to those two companies who have contributed with lots of material. And I will start with a quiz. Every time somebody talks about supply chain attacks, there's one company that always has to come up. And I hand out one self-brewed beverage for the person who can name me the first example I'm going to present today. Who said solar winds was somewhere here? Okay, this is yours. Solar winds, yes. So solar winds had a problem. Um, Somebody hacked into SolarWinds. I'll tell you later what it is. Yeah, supply chain. Yeah, SolarWinds got hacked and somebody implanted a backdoor into the Orion product of SolarWinds. And all customers that were running updates or getting updates in uh, 2019 basically also got an update with the backdoor. So all customers of SolarWinds basically were infected just because somebody breached SolarWinds. Does anybody know what SolarWinds actually does? What kind of products? Network? Network management, yes. They do network management. They know everything about your network if you're using them. They know your endpoints, they know your routers, they know your switches, they know virtual machines, they know pretty much everything. And in many cases, they can even control these. And if you think about this, a backdoor in the central component that knows everything and sees everything on your network, that gives the attacker the ultimate control over all of the targets. And this way they breached, for example, the Department of Homeland Defense, they breached Microsoft, um, they breached the Treasury in the US, all kinds of targets that are usually very hard to breach because they have a very good security posture. But they used a vendor that had not such a good security posture, and there were people alarming SolarWinds since 2017 that they needed to work on their security. Fortunately, they also breached a company called FireEye, um, and FireEye has one of the biggest incident response teams, or back then had one of the biggest incident response teams in the world, um, called Mandiant. And they found out that data was exfiltrated from their systems and then had a multi-day investigation with the best of their best people to find out what is happening. And then they found out, oh, it's actually this third-party software that we are using that has a backdoor in it. This is not the first example. There's another prominent example that uh, probably many of you have heard about. Everybody who has like more than five years of experience in the security industry on their CV has probably heard about this. There was this ransomware called Petya. And on the National Con Constitutional Day of the Ukraine in 2017, 
more than one million systems, especially in the Ukraine, were showing this message. You've become a victim of the Petya ransomware. And the impact was quite big. It was like all kinds of infrastructure. It was the central bank, airport, metro transport, and even the Chernobyl power plant that got infected. The challenge was, if you looked at the software in more detail, there was no decryption functionality. So your files got encrypted, but there was no chance at all to ever decrypt your files ever again. So it was a basically a destructive attack just pretending to be the Petya ransomware. That's why the whole thing is called the not Petya attack. How did one million systems or more than one million systems actually get this ransomware? There's a company called Medoc and they are the standard for accounting in the Ukraine. And every of their customers, basically via an auto update, got not just the newest version of the Medoc software, but also this ransomware. And not only that, there was also a worm-like functionality using the Eternal Blue exploit that spread all across the world. And then we had uh, several companies like the shipping company Mashk or TNT who got infected. And TNT alone um, said that they have probably spent like or lost 300 million US dollars just because of that incident. So there's one vendor, a small, rather small, tax software provider. And that tax software provider provides an update that is malicious and that spreads all around the world. So one weak link in the supply chain and a large impact on the overall world. Another example is uh, CodeCov. The name already indicates what it's doing. It's doing code coverage analysis. So basically in your build systems, when you um, are testing your software, you want to make sure that you have maximum coverage with all your unit tests. So it basically provides an overview of what's tested, what's not tested and supports you in that endeavor. The problem was they had some broken Docker build processes and attackers were able to extract credentials to their code repositories. These attackers then modified a file called bash uploader that all clients are using to upload test results to their cloud. And this includes, for example, all the secrets that they run in their own build systems. So because CodeCov was infiltrated and the code was modified, basically all customers in their build systems also had a backdoor and their information was uploaded. And some of these customers were, for example, Rapid7, a security company, and HashiCorp. Does anybody know what HashiCorp does? VPN. Terraform, yeah. Vault. Vault. What is Vault doing? Storing something. Storing passwords, storing secrets, storing certificates securely. And if you are one of the almost 2,000 customers of HashiCorp that rely on that they secretly store, uh, safely store your credentials and secrets, you might have a problem. Actually, HashiCorp found the incident quite quickly, so their customers were not impacted. But if they hadn't, basically all HashiCorp customers, all that rely on their safety and security, would have been breached. So there's one vendor it's breached, resulting in an, another vendor getting a backdoor, which could result in that any of you gets a backdoor. Another example is a managed service provider called Kasaya. And Kasaya is basically managing the IT infrastructure for all kinds of organizations, mostly in Europe. And they have a great tool called uh, the Virtual System Administrator. It's a web portal and basically any consultants or people working on these systems, they can basically log in and then issue hot patches. Unfortunately, that system wasn't as secure as uh, they wanted, and so attackers could bypass authentication. And then just 
issue a hotfix to all customers. There were between 800 and 1,500 businesses infected because this was not a hotfix that was pushed by attackers, it was a ransomware. Do we have anybody from Sweden here? Do you remember how Coop stores were not available for a week? Yes? So one of the larger supermarket chains in Sweden was not available yet. Like you couldn't do shopping for a week because of this ransomware attack. And it wasn't Coop's fault. They basically had selected one vendor that manages their IT infrastructure and they probably have good security practices in place all over. But the, the person, or no, not the person, the company that uh, manages their IT systems was not doing their security properly. So if you look at all these examples, maybe you think, ah, oh, that's all these organizations that have to do cost savings on the wrong ends and don't focus on security. Um, let's go with open source. That's much safer. Right? So let's have a look at open source, because that's always the question. Is it better to use than a commercial company, or is it better to use open source? The good thing about open source, everything's audited, right? Everybody looks at every line of code two or three times, and so security vulnerabilities are found right away. At least was, these were some discussions I remember from back in the 90s. So here are some examples. Um, there was a research paper where um, researchers for the University of Minnesota tried to hide a backdoor in like a, a bigger bug fix for the Linux kernel and then tried to submit it. And it actually went through several layers of code reviews for maintainers of the Linux kernel and only before it was supposed to be merged in the key branch of the Linux kernel, somebody said, this doesn't look right. And suddenly they banned that all, re all researchers from the University of Minnesota to commit code. Um, this was just a research project. But imagine if somebody really gets something, a backdoor in the Linux kernel. Uh, Linux is running on many of the IoT devices. It's running on your mobile phone, many mobile phones that you have. It's running on servers, appliances, um, some routers. So with that, you basically have more a backdoor in more than half of our <laughs> hardware infrastructure. And Stephen, now it's your turn. So Stephen gave a great talk yesterday. If you haven't seen it, maybe uh, you can talk to him later. Um, he defended PHP a bit, um, because PHP is still used, right? And actually has uh, grown quite significantly. PHP was breached in 2021. Um, they basically had their own Git server Git code repository that they maintain themselves. But the team is focusing mostly on developing the language forward and not necessarily on maintaining the server, the source server that they have. So it was breached and attackers were implanting a backdoor into PHP, which means every project that is using PHP had a backdoor or would have gotten a backdoor because luckily they actually found out within 24 hours that they got breached and then, met, uh, then moved to a hosted Git repository. Maybe quick, quick hands up. Who is still using PHP here? <laughs> <laughs> well, Facebook is still using PHP. We had that dis discussion. Um, there are also all kinds of other companies. WordPress, I mean, that's a big uh, content management system still out in the net. So there's still a lot of use of PHP and probably half of you are not even admitting that you're using PHP now after I gave that example. That's all right. Um, who develops code here? Nice. So what would you say is the typical amount of imports or libraries that you do or have? Finger in the air, when you start a new project, Sorry? 80%. 80 yeah. Let's put that to um, like a, a full number. Let's say you use 10 imports yeah, or 10 libraries that you rely on. And uh, you're pretty certain that these 10 are like good libraries. Um, you know very well what they are doing. A lot of people are using them. 
So we, you rely on that. But these 10 libraries probably also use 10 other libraries. And then each of them, again, uses 10 libraries. So at, at level three, we have basically 1,000 libraries that we are directly or indirectly importing into our software project. And that creates um, a lot of issues and especially a complexity that we have a big problem controlling. And one example how things further down in the chain can uh, lead to problems is this uh, node library, UA parser. UA stands for user agent. And uh, the user agent is an important component that uh, a lot of projects, especially on the server side, need to read. And that means they also have uh, 7 million downloads per week, so a very, very active project. Um, there was one developer account that got compromised, and now the package JSON was modified in a way that a pre-install script was added. And that pre-install script checked which operating system somebody would install the package on, and depending if it was, for example, Mac computer or Windows computer or Linux computer, it would download a specific executable that was malware and then could exfiltrate basically everything from your build or even production environment. Has anybody heard about UA parser before? Yeah? Is it, are you using it? You don't know. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, if you look at like who is directly or indirectly using it, you find out that there are quite a couple of companies uh, that are using it. And I'm pretty sure you have one or the other either on your laptop or on your mobile phone. Which means, indirectly, you could also be affected. So these third-party dependencies, they are very often hard to control. And there are some specific attacks that we want to talk about that we are seeing more and more. Um, one is called dependency confusion. And dependency confusion is because some yeah, organizations have components that they have internal, but not external. For example, um, if you look at the example down here, that's from um, PayPal API. And PayPal is pushing, is making this API publicly available. When they build it internally, they have all kinds of additional components and libraries that they use, uh, which are not exposed to the outside, like, for example, a PayPal logger, specific logger that they are using. And um, there was a researcher called um, Alex Birsan who wanted to find out what actually happens if I put the same component out in a public node repository. And then he found out that actually, whenever then PayPal tries to build this component, they're not using their internal library, they're actually using the one in the public repository. So he was able, by just registering and uploading a component that had the same name, what was happening within PayPal. And he, he went one step further, he also this way owned Microsoft, Apple, uh, Netflix, Tesla, Uber, um, some of these smaller companies that we have out there in the world. So these attacks are getting more and more prominent. Um, for example, there's an AI library called PyTorch. Um, has anybody used PyTorch before? You have. For what kind of application? Just traveling in this way. Okay, as a research tool. Excellent. Um, PyTorch is also the standard framework for OpenAI. Has anybody heard about OpenAI? Yeah? Anybody has played with Chat GPT-3 or um, DAL-E, the image generator? That is OpenAI, and this is their, like their core framework. And what happened during uh, Christmas and New Year, last year, but just three weeks ago, is that the nightly builds were compromised by a so-called dependency chain problem. Again, they had like an internal library that was called Torch Triton. And in their nightly builds, they used to fetch the internal component and build based on that, until some attackers actually in the official PyPy, the Python packet, package index, 
published a component with the same version number and same name, which was then included in the nightly builds, and everybody using those nightly builds automatically got the backdoor. What did the backdoor do? Um, it got all kinds of information about your hostname, resolve conf working directory, environment variables. Very exciting, because especially if you use like a yeah, cloud-based backend where you store, store all kinds of um, secrets in your environment variables, maybe. It didn't stop there. It also uploaded the etc password files, um, SSH folder, including all files, and the first 1,000 files in the home folder. So a lot of very sensitive information. Um, I think the, the attack got a little bit too hot for the attackers. Um, and then they said, we're just ethical hackers and wanted to basically get your attention for the problem. Uh, but what, why do you then need SSH private keys? So dependency confusion is a problem that becomes more and more. And also you should think about it if you develop code and only have internal libraries. Is there a possibility for somebody to register in an official package index, a component with the same name, and this way control your internal builds and your internal software. Because they don't need to hack your organization. They just need to publish something. Here's an attack that you need to help a bit on. Um, you mentioned that about 80% of your code is external. Right? So when you pick those 80%, um, sometimes people don't really know what was now the name of what I needed to download. Um, there's one example where attackers, or there are several examples, but one that I brought today, uh, where attackers are misusing that concept of that you don't really know which library to use. There's a wonderful uh, library for JavaScript, it's called Browserify. It basically takes all your JavaScript dependencies, bundles them into one single file, and that's the way you save on downloads. You basically only need to ship one blob of JavaScript and have everything in there. Very cool tool. So now if you think, oh, that sounds interesting. I could use that for one of my projects. And you go back home from the conference and think, what was the name? Browserify? And you look up in the um, package indexes, and you find, oh, there's a Browserify. And there's also web browserify. So which one was the right one? If you pick the web browserify, you actually again get a fork of the original browserify, but with a post install modification of the package JSON. So when you install it again, there is some backdoor suddenly in your system. And it sounds very, very easy, like you just need to pay attention. Um, my favorite example is um, I like to use Nmap, the network scanner, and they have a Python wrapper. And it's called Python Nmap. Or was it Nmap Python? I, I can never remember. So what can you do? Any, any thoughts on what you can do to identify which is the right component? You're back home. Wonderful. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, basically, the answer was there are lots of metrics that we can look into, like number of downloads, for example, um, how old is the project, um, the version number, various things kind of take the reputation of such a project into account. And that's what we all do intuitively. The problem is that attackers are following that our thinking that reputation is important. And they use a method that you commonly refer to as start checking. For example, number of downloads. That's easy to fake, right? You can just download something like double the amount of time than the original project and suddenly it gets up in ranking. Or you um, have lots of fake accounts that star this project 
and then it becomes even more popular than the original project. Or if it's the number of commits, if you're looking at the number of commits for the project, well, you could just commit stupid stuff. Take, put something in, take it back. Nobody really looks at all the commit changes. They, you only look at the number of commits because for you it's more about reputation. And uh, the version number, I mean, it's very easy to increase the version number, right? So that's something that ad takers take into account. You could still say, maybe I'll... Um, Maybe I'll just take the newest, uh, the oldest project. That's the one that has been around the longest. But then you might end up in a situation where a project has been forked and you actually co continue working on a very old project. So it's also not that easy. So let's have a look at some of the reality impact that we are seeing and have seen. And maybe some of you have been in Dan and Daniel's presentation on Log4j just uh, before that. Yeah, lots of nodding heads. Log4j is one of the main, or if not the main, logging component in Java and has been around since 2011. And because of that, it has also been used by lots of projects. There are estimations that more than 100 million devices were vulnerable to log4j. And um, well, I, I can't explain it in such an amazing way as Dan, Daniel did it. But basically, the idea is if you can control, control the logging string, you can say instead of just logging something, you want to download something from a remote location and then just log the output, um, theoretically. The problem was then there are 100 million devices or more that are infected. If you're working in an IT team or IT security team, which ones do you have to actually deal with or look at? Did anybody have to deal with Log4j here? Yeah. How, how long was the project? How long did you have to work on Log4j? Okay. That was pretty quick. Usually I hear like a, the magnitude of a month before people have really found out which systems were vulnerable or had log4j. And that's the problem. We have such a large amount of software and dependencies, we have no overview. We don't even know where to start looking. Um, we don't know how to scan. And so usually it takes, so in your case, you were lucky, it only took a week and a weekend. Uh, in many cases, we heard it took weeks. The whole situation changes when you suddenly have something like a software bill of materials. When you have like an inventory of things that you are running on your computers like. Let's say I run uh, Microsoft whatever, and it has these and these open source libraries included in it. And also these other Microsoft um, components it's using, it's relying on. So if you have a list like that, a large database, you can basically solve the problem in minutes by just a database lookup. But who has that? <clears throat> So I'm not providing solutions yet. We're going to solutions later. Uh, I want to give you some more examples to show you how complex the situation can get. Um, there's this beautiful TCP IP stack called UIP. Is anybody down low in the details of TCP IP stacks has worked with that before? No? Okay. Didn't expect that. Um, the point is UIP was basically forked by various vendors. Um, Contiki, D-Link is probably one that you've heard about. Um, Open Icecase is also using it. They're using variants of this TCP IP stack. Then suddenly somebody found a problem in the original UIP TCP IP stack. So what to do now? Um, it's not enough to just fix it in UIP because also it has to be fixed in all the forks. In some of the forks, you could just apply the original patch. In other forks, 
they changed so much already that you that they had to create their own patch again. So there are five different projects that have to handle a vulnerability that was found. And this is just a TCP IP stack. Um, you can't do much with that in a system. Usually a TCP IP stack goes into an operating system. And because this is a very specialized one, it goes usually into embedded operating systems. And embedded operating systems very often go into some kind of hardware, like for example, a network management card. And a network management card goes into a network device, like for example, a UPS. So how do you make sure that your fixes that you found in the original stack gets in all four of the forks and the original stack, in all operating systems, in all network cards or devices where the operating system is used, and then also into the final appliances or product. And all of these vendors have to play along that are using those in order to get the problem fixed or it will stay there forever. And that's actually how it looks like in reality. Um, there's the TCP IP stack. For example, here, one vendor, Trek Inc. It goes into an operating system by a vendor called Digi, which is then uh, providing this as input for all kinds of medical devices, especially in wireless communication modules. So there are two different medical device vendors that create two different medical devices. And all of them have to be patched when a problem is found in one of these systems. Holy crap. How do you deal with that? So let's revisit the problem a little bit more. Like where are all the different elements where this can create issues? So first of all, you need to make sure that nobody can submit authorized co unauthorized code changes. Then you need to make sure, like the PHP project, that you secure your code repository. Then you need to build. Oh, by the way, this picture is from the Salsa framework, and uh, you can find it on the internet. So you don't need to take pictures. So step number three, you need to make sure that from the source code repository to the build system, nothing is modified that none of the upload plugins, like we've seen with CodeCov, for example, gets modified. We need to make sure that the build process is also not modified, that we, for example, have a compiler that has a backdoor. We've also seen that, I think Xcode had that for some time, um, the Mac compiler. We need to make sure that we don't have any compromised dependencies, like third-party open source libraries. Um, once we have built, we need to upload it somewhere into like a package repository. We need to make sure that nothing is modified over there. Um, also, we need to make sure that the package repository itself is not compromised and somehow the package needs to go or the product needs to go to some kind of end consumer. All of this has to be secured. And we have solutions for some of those, but usually there's no single solution for all of that. Um, like, for example, the last parts from the package repository to the consumer, digital signature can very often be used. Not always, but in many cases. So this helps a little bit. What gives hope is actually that this problem is not only seen by uh, developers and security people, it's also seen on the very highest level. Like, for example, President Biden in the US, who has said um, from very soon on, actually from now on, pretty much, every provider of software to the US government needs to provide a software bill of materials. That means you need to provide a list of everything that went into your software before you hand it over to the US government. So that you don't have to work weekends and uh, have teams working a whole week on finding out where are actually our problems. What about you? Um, what can you do? And if you want to do something, we need models for a very complex security challenge. Here's an example about what you should not do. Um, I found this in a, in a blog post for a security company. 
Um, their suggestion to solve all of this was, well, it's pretty easy. You just get your security team to look at the identity of each developer, of each project, of each library, and just check if they are valid. Have they also been uh, involved in uh, some malicious activity? Do they actually have LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter accounts? Um, yeah, is the uh, user associated with a well-known company, or is it more like um, yeah, hacker style? So if you only do these things, you know, you're pretty secure. You only need to do this for about like 10,000 developers that have been involved in all your open source dependencies. So if you have too many people, don't waste them on that, then rather hand them over to us, we can use some good people. Um, a bit better, at least uh, showing you the direction, is actually what the National Cyber Security Center in the UK is providing. Uh, they give like a, a rough idea. For example, security development is everyone's concern. And that means not only the developer, not only the project manager, now it's also the CEO. It's also that finance has to be involved. You need to have budget for it. Um, you need to keep your security knowledge sharp. And again, not only in development. Great that you're all here and want to learn about cybersecurity. And there have been fantastic talks uh, that I've seen that got a lot of new input, at least for me. Then producing clean and maintainable code. That's probably more on, on your table. Because the messier the code is, the harder it is to find actually commits from other people um, that have backdoors. Secure your development environment, protect your code repository, secure the build and deployment pipeline, continually test your security, not just of the product, but also of the company, right? Of your organization. Run some pen tests. Has anybody done phishing trainings? Yeah, those are wonderful because then you cannot as easily get attacked from other angles, like, for example, the HR department gets hacked, and from there they go into the development environment. And also, plan for security flaws. There will always be a security incident. If you reach a certain size of, a, of an organization, there will be breaches. You will have a bug in your software. But you need to plan around that. Um, the worst situation is, and probably... A, You've heard that before, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we have this security bug, but I, at least our sprints for the next half year are already planned out. So we are not really agile enough to uh, put the security fixes in one of the sprints. Right? No, you need to have some buffer, for example, in your sprints, and you need to have awareness also from product management, product owners, and the development teams to fix stuff. That's all. Uh, I see some people yawning already. That's all, that's all right. Um, the more interesting solutions are actually some very concrete frameworks. For example, Salsa, developed by Google. And this is more like hands-on checklists about what you can do to take your organization one step further. They work on so-called levels. And they want to make sure, basically, that you can step-by-step step reach the next level. For example, the first step assumes that you have a really messy build process. Everything's just built on developer machines. And the first step is just to make sure that you actually, you can still continue to build on developer machines. But the first step is to find out what dependencies did you actually, actually use? When was the build created? What was the hash of it? So that you can later verify if it was modified, very simple steps just to make sure you know what's happening in your build process. Second step is that you get your build system into a stage where it's reproducible, where it's not just on one developer machine, but for example, a hosted service where builds can be recreated and then tested about what happened in there. Number three is where you also have all build steps in code so that you can actually go back and see what specifically was done in order to build the product, plus then getting also security best practices into the system. So this is a very hands-on approach. 
And um, there are lots of examples actually in code that you can get when you look at the Salsa project that can make your infrastructure more secure. As mentioned, the whole problem is very complex. And one solution to deal with this complexity is, for example, OWASP SAM, the Software Assurance Maturity Model, because it takes also the complexity inside the overall organization into account. So there's, for example, a governance perspective, a design perspective, an implementation perspective, a verification and an operations perspective. And if you think about some of the elements in here, they completely make sense. There's, for example, on the governance perspective, you need to make training, for example, to developers, but also to all other departments, because it doesn't help if your HR department gets infected and from there the development systems somehow get breached. So you need to educate everybody on phishing, for example. Um, you need to make sure you have some standards in the company, for example, that everybody should run antivirus software security software on their system. And you also need to make sure that everybody up to the CEO is on board. Um, maybe some of you heard the presentation from Shipstead yesterday, Stoller. He actually talked about that it was much easier for them to drive security forward when the CEO was on board. Then, of course, design is important. You need to make sure um, you do some threat modeling, for example, you have a secure architecture and you actually know what kind of requirements you have to secure systems. Then you need to implement it, secure build, like we talked about what the Salsa framework is focusing on. Uh, you need to make sure you can uh, deploy secure and again, defect management. What happens if you find a problem in your software? Then verification, of course, you need uh, requir requirements driven testing, you need security testing, from time to time, it just makes sense to do a pen test. Um, architecture, but also you need operational pieces. For example, um, in our team, we very often do exploit research and sometimes we find problems. Uh, recently, one of our team members has found a privilege escalation in pretty much any endpoint security vendor. So he was basically able to hack their products to become root on any system. And then he tried to report this to all these organizations. And some of them had pretty good incident response or actually an address that you can reach out to and say, hey, I found a problem in your product. Some other vendors, they don't have an email address, they don't have any person you can talk to or tend to or report the problem to. And then this gets lost and it will never reach the development teams. So you also need to have some approachable person or a channel like, I think ships that used, what was not Hacker One, what was the other one? Does anybody remember? Integrity? Inte integrity, yes, thank you. So that's what they used in order to be approachable, to have the right channels. That's part of the operational element. So a complex problem also sometimes requires a complex solution. Um, OWASP SAM promises that you actually can get a quick start in 30 minutes, which is good. There are 30 questions, by the way, 30 ele elements. So you have one minute to answer each question. And I want to give you an example. Um, do you classify applications according to business risk? Think about that. Do you classify applications according to business risk based on a simple and predefined set of questions? Who can answer this question in this room right now? I, I hope at least one hand goes up. Yeah, awesome, thank you. So it's not a simple question to answer. So in most cases you will on all 30 questions say, I don't know yet. And then you need to go and find out, are we actually fulfilling this? And, um, but it gives you a very clear idea on where you need to go in the end. Very clear. And the nice thing is OWASP, depending on your score, also helps you with benchmarks. So you can find out what are other companies in our field scoring like. How's the sec our security compared to the rest of the world, for example? 
Do we have anybody with a CISO or similar background here? No. I'll, I'll offer another beverage if you admit it. <laughs> now you can get a drink for free if you just fake it. Okay, excellent. Wonderful. So you've just earned a beverage. So this, the CISO's job is, always, is not to avoid any attack, but the CISO's job is to basically run faster from the bear than everybody else. So as long as the CISO, and uh, thank you for being our role model here, the CISO's job is to make sure that they are better than the industry peers. And there is a framework for that, that they can use. Um, Sig Sigital, now part of Synopsys, they have basically a questionnaire. They go around and ask organizations, what do you do for security? And then this company say, yeah, for example, we deploy endpoint um, protection. We also have firewalls and we do pen tests and so on. And then they basically take these best practices that they see in some companies, categorize them into specific categories, and then ask other companies, do you do this? Yes, no. Do you do that? Yes, no. Or even some smaller steps in between. Um, the point is that you can then very easily benchmark yourself to other industry peers and get a rough idea where they're going. So it's good enough to um, basically get some more funding. If you're saying, oh, on the ad tech models, we are lagging a bit behind. We need funding for that. You know, it's more easy to get that. Um, so who fell asleep when I used the word governance? If that was the case, then now you can wake up again because then this is the framework that you want to use. Safe code. Safe code is basically um, a list of hands-on best practices, really hands-on, um, saying, for example, if you want to scan your network for vulnerabilities, use Nessus. It's free, it's open source. And then it says, well, if you're interested in the topic and want to dive deeper, here are some things that you can read on, and here are some other tools that might be cool. And it doesn't say this is the final state that you need to get to. Um, it's more like, have a look at one of these areas that interests you and have a look at the tools so you make your security in your organization a little bit better in that area that interests you. If you're coming from a government or policymaker perspective, then BSA is an interesting framework. Um, I'll not go into the details. Also, NIST has a framework. It's called the Secure Software Development Framework, SSDF. And they are not trying to reinvent the wheel, um, but they are basically using the best practices from all the other frameworks and try to make sense out of it into a best practice framework. You're shaking your head. Um, is that because you're disagreeing on something? You want to correct me? Or oh, I thought it was a... Because I'm, I haven't used this framework in, in detail. Um, I just think it's very interesting. There's another framework I haven't used, but I still want to call it out. Um, there's also an ISO standard, of course. So if you think that ISO 27001 was the best thing that ever happened to you in your life, like you got turned on like never before, then this might actually be the right solution for you. Uh, I haven't spent the money on it, so I can't tell you more about it, unfortunately, but I just wanted to mention that ISO also has a standard for that. So, summarizing what we talked about today. There are probably 1,001 ways to backdoor your organization with a software supply chain vulnerability. And even if you think you might not be the target, maybe one of your customers or your customers' customers might be the target. Fortunately, uh, there's a lot of guidance on how you can improve your security posture. And it's not about perfection. You cannot prevent being breached, but you can harden your organization and your processes. If you're more like a hands-on person, Salsa or Safecode are the places to start on. If you really enjoy compliance, well, then go with SAM or BSIM. 
And if you like to look at lots of alternatives, there are some more at the bottom down here. So there was a lot of input, and with that, I would like to open it up for questions. First person to ask a question gets another <laughs> beverage. Wonderful. What's in the cans? <laughs> What's in the cans? Thank you. Uh, it's called cross pint, um, but because we work in the financial world, we cannot make advertisements. Um, we're not allowed to do that. So this is a beer that our team has brewed. It's a pale ale with a slight tint of lemon in it. Yeah, self-brewed um, because we um, located at Rebel here in Oslo and uh, there's a brewery in the basement that you can rent as a team. And we did that. We brewed uh, 600 liters of beer. having a software bill of material, what would be actually a practical uh, relationship with the vendor? So the question was how, and I'll try to paraphrase it a little bit, how do you ensure that the vendor you're getting your software from actually has good security best practices? Yeah. yeah. And you gave several examples on how this could be done. For example, you asked them for the last pen test report. Um, that is one step you can do. In general, it would be beneficial if we also in Europe follow the US approach that we at least provide the software bill of materials for everything that's created so that you have an idea what is actually going into my organization. And there are already standardized formats for it. So it's not like you suddenly get an Excel sheet or something. Um, there are standardized formats and you can just take those and combine it into one larger database, which is very helpful. In general, it helps to do to ask some questions to the vendors, uh, like simple security questions, like um, what tools do you use to um, secure your cloud infrastructure? Um, what are your password policies? And if you just ask simple questions, you might notice that the vendor sometimes says, um, and then you know you need to dive a little bit deeper into that and you get a good um, good idea. We also looked into risk tools that do vendor risk assessments. Um, they might be a good starting point, um, but they don't go deep enough from my perspective. Uh, they usually only look like at the external attack surface and not the internal security best practices. Hope that answered your question. Please. I was wondering for us who are developers, uh, do mm -hmm. you have any advice on what we can do specifically, for example, during a month, other than being careful about our dependencies, maybe taking a look at some of the frameworks? Yeah, so the question was what, as developers, can we do to uh, make our environment more safe against software supply chain attacks? Um, so the best thing you can do is, is to create awareness. Um, like in bigger organizations, for example, the CISO is always involved in purchases of external components. Of course, not in open source libraries, but at least in external components. And then it makes sense if you don't have the capacity in terms of manpower to actually look at all the um, third-party libraries that you have to use a tool for that. Um, there are lots of vendors out there, and I think even some in the, in the lobby, um, that do code scanning for you. And they will tell you if some software or library that you're using has a vulnerability. So you don't need to do all of that yourself, you can rely on third parties. But of course, then you need budget again for that, or use some open source tools that are available. I think it's also time for lunch break soon, right? There's one more question, yes. How do you think about SALT? Uh, well, those are a lot of frameworks, but how do you 
so I'm dealing with this because this is a very insurmountable problem that's not easy to solve. Uh, I mean, there are ways to start working on it, but you can't solve it. There is no solution for it. But how would you recommend it? Of course, there are frameworks to do it, but like, do you recommend like embedding uh, tools that are used throughout the uh, business a lot, like doing uh, reviews for them or asking them if they have done uh, code reviews or external reviews? You know, how would you say what, what are the steps to do it? Yeah, the best. This, so the question was, what are the good, what are good starting points to actually get to a secure state? Is that a good summary of your question? Okay. Um, so this can be driven from from two sides. It can be driven from the developer side, but it can also be driven from the top, the president, right? Like we see in the U.S. And actually, um, in the U.S., there's something happening that it's pretty good. And that is that security, cyber security, needs to be part of board meetings now. That means uh, security personnel like a CISO, they need to be present in the board meeting. They need to educate also the CEO, um, CFO, all kinds of executives. And this way, from the president down into the boards, into the executives, all the way down into the organization, uh, we see the changes, which I think is a very good approach. Because there's no CEO that can say, ah, no, I don't, I don't do that. If you want to start from a development, developer's perspective, I think this conference is perfect. Because you can ask others, how are you dealing with this? When you use a new open source library, how do you vet it? Do, do you have tools that you can use? Or like I heard from Amazon, there are some Amazon teams that code review every open source library that they are using. I mean, that's a lot of, of time spent, and not every team can do that. Um, but this conference is perfect to discuss with others, peers that have about the same size in organization as you, what tools are you using? And of course, I can give you a couple of vendors here, uh, but I probably also forget a couple of vendors then, so I would be very biased, so I only take that question in, in private afterwards. Okay, then thank you very much, everybody.